right, so let's start shop at 3.10. Um, there's a lot of sessions. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming to these sessions. I realize that there are a lot of sessions for you to pick. And for you to pick these sessions, thank you very much from my heart. Um, you're probably um, thinking, what is this Asian guy doing here? It's like, I, is he showing, going to show some Chinese Kung Fu? <laughs> Not really. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit of, of uh, design tools. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in always is to talk about design in a conference that's focused on technical. Because I think one of the things that's all often overlooked is the design. And a lot of times, developers doesn't know what can they expect from designer. And this is why I'm giving this talk here. And hopefully, you know, you can get an idea what you can expect from a uh, designer. So first of all, um, I just want to talk that uh, I'm coming from Malaysia. How many of you heard about Malaysia? <laughs> Thank you. So I braved through 14 hours flight here, having jet lag right now. <laughs> um, but still, I'm very excited to share um, some of the things that I feel like really want to share with you guys and girls, of course. So alternative title for this is what to expect as uh, mobile developers or, or web developers, actually, uh, from designer for, for design handoff. How many of you are developers here? Oh, thank you. And you are intrigued today because these slides is the proof that things that you can expect from designer. So if your designer doesn't provide you what you are expecting, just show them these slides or this talk, you know. Give me this. Taylor say this. By the way, my name is Taylor. So let's get started. I don't want to uh, de delay too much. So in a not so distant past, like probably seven, eight years ago, when you ask designer what kind of tool that they are using um, to design you know, screens or stuff. Probably they will say Photoshop, of course, um, Illustrator, and some will be using Fireworks. But, you know, moving to today, actually there's so many tools out there. There's so many design tools out there that you, for designer, you, they actually have to make a choice to use which tool is the most comfortable one for them, uh, what, which tools is able to provide stuff um, or hands off for the developer to use. And probably you might be asking, you know, as a developer, why should you care? Um, I think it's, it's really, really important for you at least f to have an idea. Because um, with all the tools there, the main goal is not just for designer to design the things like screen or illustrations or icons. It's also that these tools enable uh, the designer to provide all the design handoff for the developers. So developers will be able to implement the design more efficiently uh, with accurate specs uh, and stuff like that. So it's very important that you have an idea that, oh, actually, there are already design tools out there available for the designer. But if, let's say, your designer is not providing you with that, you know, where, you know what to do. So, you know, for designer, it's always thinking about whether we should learn some coding or convince the developers to, 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 to do implement the design uh, as design. Um, obviously, my point of view is designers should also know a little bit of coding, especially CSS, uh, HTML. But of course, they also uh, need to know, before, before that happening, uh, they have to know that what kind of things they can help to, to ease the life of developers so that they are able to do their job more efficiently. Instead of, you know, I'm pretty sure some of you might be doing, you know, asset slicing from the design file from designer because your designer doesn't provide you with the assets or uh, trying to figure out from a video how the animation works. It doesn't work that way. Designer should be the one who provides you. So first thing, let's talk about uh, visual design. So visual design, of course, uh, it's the most uh, important one, of course, is screen design. But we also use design tools to design icons and also illustrations. A um, couple of tools out there that's pretty famous right now, um, available for designers. The most famous one, if you're using the uh, Mac ecosystem, you probably heard about Sketch, still the number one um, in, our uh, in the design uh, community um, because of the plugin system and stuff like that. But there are also upcoming tools like Adobe XD, Framer, Figma and Graphic Designer. 
So if you are Android developers, one of the things about Android development is um, there are a lot of density buckets. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, if you're developing it, you, you know it. So designers should always design the screen in this uh, size, 640 times 360. Um, I will, I will tell you why, okay? But uh, designing that doesn't mean that it's a fixed screen, you know? When you design with that size, you also, the designer need to aware that the screen sizes of uh, Android devices or iOS devices is dynamic, so it can change in any sizes. So the design should always able to adapt to different screen sizes. So why 360 times 640 is a base size, um, which is, uh, we, we, we call it in the MDPI, uh, bucket density, which is 1x. So what's the advantage of designing the screen in 1x screen? Um, of course, obviously, obviously it helps in spec handoff and also accepts uh, extractions or generations. So you can see here, okay, like this icon is in 24 uh, dp, uh, the density uh, pixel in Android, and that's directly translated to that. You know, the gap here between the cards and the today label is 24 dp, and that, those are the values that the Android developers will be able to use directly in, in uh, Android Studios uh, when they are doing the coding. So this is why designers should always design in this um, screen sizes instead of in the larger sizes, and then the developers might need to divide the value by two or divide by 1.5. That, that should not happen, actually. Designers should always design in 1x um, density bucket so it can ease off uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, design handoff. And why this size? Okay, so this size, um, it can represent by one of the devices by Google uh, Nexus 5, uh, which is the base size of Android uh, devices. And if you compare it to, you know, the latest um, Google Pixel devices, um, you can see that in comparison in Google Pixel, there are extra spaces compared to the base size of Nexus 5. And the reason why I'm recommending to design in this smaller size is because when you give a little bit more size uh, space for designer, things become very dangerous. You know, designer tend to fit in a little, bit, a little bit more things here, a little bit more things there, and they are not aware that by doing that, it can become a very difficult thing for to develop sometimes because you might you might encounter screen with uh, the devices with screen that's smaller. And that actually happens in Android as well. Um, in Android, of course, as I mentioned, you, sh I mean, the designer should design in 360 times uh, 640 points. But uh, there is also another um, Android called Android Go, which is a lower end Android meant for, um, you know, like the countries that are not affordable to buy uh, expensive Android phones. And those phones have a base size which is even smaller than the base size that I'm suggesting. Um, so how to do, how we deal with that? So for us um, in Fabulous, uh, in, in my startups, what we're doing is that we try to design every screen thinking about the responsiveness, of course, no matter how small or how large is the screen. But when there's a specific screen that doesn't really um, fit in a smaller screen, we will think of alternative uh, solutions. So in this case, you know, uh, you can see that in the larger screens, um, this bar is not in front, but uh, in the smaller screen, we make it in front just to make the wheel behind scrollable, to make it a little bit more responsive based on different screen sizes. So that's very important. Designers should always think from that point of view. So if your designer is not thinking from that point of view and you know, trying to design everything fits so nicely in this size and when it becomes smaller or larger, things become differently and they are not thinking about the responsive uh, strategy, definitely approach them to see what they have to say about it. Because they, are, they should be the one actually think about it. And of course, for iOS, um, it's the same case. It's always best to design this in the smallest one. Uh, this, this screen size is actually uh, representing the iPhone 5S, iPhone SE. Um, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm actually aware that a lot of designers um, designing, uh, start to design iOS apps in I iPhone 6 or iPhone 6 Plus sizes. Um, while it's fun to design with these large screen sizes, um, 
essentially have a very huge potential danger there because with that large screen size, you actually didn't think what happened if uh, iPhone SE size uh, users is looking at how developers should actually implement that in a smaller screen because you know everything should still fit into iPhone the smaller iPhone and still usable for the users. So for designers, definitely if we, they are designing in larger screen sizes um, and there's no reference to small screen size, definitely get them to design in smaller screen. This is the size that it should be, uh, 320 times uh, five, six, uh, eight point. Because the same thing, uh, if you design in one X, everything, every value will be usable by the developers, okay? 24 points, uh, 56 point of the high, everything is usable. So definitely, as I said, um, we, we are all aware that there are a lot of iPhones, they so so much larger, iPhone 10, they so tall. But still, if you look at this, um, it's still safe to design in this smaller, the, the smallest screen size, and then respond, uh, become, to, to have a responsive strategy uh, as you go with the biggest screen size. And also with design tools, um, there are a lot of resources out there. For example, by Google, there's a material team editor um, for you to do your, uh, for, for the designer to do material design uh, um, for their screen sizes, uh, screen design. And if you're interested in material design, I think Anna, Anna have uh, sessions today, 5, 10. Um, I'm not sure which room, but uh, it's today. And also Apple, uh, they have their own resources scattered for dif different design tools. So the design tool is actually already there, pretty established for, you know, like for a couple of years, eight, nine years, and it's stable enough for them to provide everything that developers uh, is needed um, for screen designs. So first, visual design. So what you can expect from designer? Of course, obviously, it's the first thing, screen design in base sizes, as I mentioned, Android, iOS, um, because it helps in spec and off. Uh, it helps to produce the, des the design handoff and implementation for the developers. And with the um, design templates, and also all these design tools have all these functions called you know, symbols, uh, which the designer can reuse some of the UI patterns and stuff like that. You can expect a little bit more consistent uh, consistency in the design. For example, if you talk about back then we use Photoshop, um, there's no such tools or there's no such features. You probably can see for the same label, um, the font size can be different from this screen and to another screens. And that's create a very bad inconsistency and developers will be confused. So with all these new features in these design tools, a more consistent design can be expected from designer. Then of course, moving on, is the design asset, which is probably one of the most important um, things that developers care about because they, they want to get the, all the assets like icons and stuff like that from designer to, to use in the implementations. So it's the, responsible, it's the responsibility of the designer to actually aware what are the things that they should extract for the developers. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm pretty aware that uh, there's a lot of de de developers actually having the design files from the de designers, and then they do their slicings, um, you know, generating the assets. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it, it works, but uh, actually it should be the responsibilities of designer to do that, um, because developers should actually spend time on some other things, like coding, for example. So these are the things that designers should know. So what are the things that should be generated? What are the things should not be generated? For example, in this case, illustrations, icons uh, should be generated. But let's say, you know, like in Android, for example, um, the buttons, oops, it just died. <laughs> Let me just change. Okay, I will just continue on the computer. Um, so for cards and the, uh, you know, the tags and other stuff, the, the, the designer doesn't have to extract them because it can be generated in codes. So the, the, the designer should actually know that. But knowing that is not sufficient enough. They also pr should provide the developers in the proper format. So for example, PNG, of course, 
But let's say in Android, um, they can be in SVG as well for vector um, implementations. And what about iOS? So for iOS, of course, they also need to know what are the things that can, should be extract, and also in the proper format, like PNG or PDF. I will touch a little bit on the format. So of course, for Android development, um, if, uh, if you are Android developers, you definitely know that there's a lot of density buckets. And uh, developers should always provide you with, if it's in PNG, it should be always in different sizes. Um, so it can be used for different density bucket. But let's say if you are going for a vector workflow, uh, definitely it's just need one asset, which is in SVG. And in Android Studio, I think you can convert it to a vector drawable. So it can, it can just have one asset for all different devices. And if you are interested in work, vector workflows, uh, Alex have a section tomorrow um, about vector workflows. Which is, exact, which is exactly the things that I'm saying here, um, using vectors for all the de devices. iOS, same thing, PNGs, um, you have different densities, so you have to, the designer have to provide three different assets. But of course, in iOS, 1x bucket is, is totally phased off. Uh, there's no more screen or no more devices with the 1x screens. So the designer should always provide you with 2x and 3x assets only. But of course, for vectors, workflow in iOS, they, they should provide you a PDF, so you can use it at 1x, uh, and then you can use it for different screen densities. But of course, assets is one thing, okay? I can provide all the assets that you need, but when you look at this particular, particular UI, and the, the one that I highlighted, the morning ritual cards, you probably can guess how it's constructed. But Probably the designer have different thinking, actually, how, how it should be constructed. So let's just look at, at the different perspective. So this is the card um, that's appearing on the UI. But for designer, probably these are the things that they see. How this part, uh, how this card is actually constructed. So you have a background with a card, uh, with a certain colors. And then the assets that which I will be generating for you should be right aligned in this card, and then there's a screen or you know, a 20% black in front of it so it can do some text protections, and then the text label in front of it. So these informations are not available for you when you look at just a static image. So these are the things that the designer should always provide to you as well. So if your designer is not providing to you, definitely get back to them. Tell me how this UI is constructed from your point of view and then we will develop it for you. Because you can't just guess. I mean, looking at it, you might be guessing it right, you might be guessing it wrong, but don't, don't waste time to guess it. Just go back to your designer because they should be the one who actually let you know. And speaking about um, the assets, of course, uh, I mentioned a lot of PNGs. PNG is probably still the best um, format for both Android and iOS or even web. Um, especially for assets that requires transparency. But uh, in our case, uh, in Fabulous, uh, we actually experienced that the app size become larger and larger with all the PNGs assets. Um, at one point, we actually have the asset um, size of 46 megabyte, about 46 megabyte uh, in, in the package for just assets. And that's not something great because uh, we don't definitely want to, want to lower down the download size so more users can download the app because of the smaller size. So what we do is actually we do a lot of optimization. Um, we first convert assets that can be converted to JPEG. So what I mean is that assets that doesn't require transparency, we will just convert them to JPEG. Um, and then we will optimize it with a compression engine uh, to, uh, with the quality of you know, JPEG with 85% of quality, PNG is 90. And what we actually managed to have is a reduction of more than half of the total size, uh, which is down to 20 meg, uh, megabytes. So definitely these are the things that the designer should be aware of and should do before they pass you the assets. 
definitely you can do the, uh, I, I think you can do the post uh, optimization through Android Studio and stuff like that. Um, but if the designer is able to do that before they hand, hand off uh, all the assets for you, then, then you don't have to do anything. So from the design assets point of view, what you can expect from designer is, of course, uh, usable design assets at the proper sizes that for different screen density. They definitely have to aware about the screen density um, knowledge. Uh, if they don't, definitely get them to read about the screen density and how they should generate the proper uh, asset sizes because it, it should not be something that the developer do. Um, assets should be in an appropriate format, um, should be properly documented if you know, there's some special way of using them, and op optimized, of course, as I said. Visual design, um, design assets, then goes to design specs. Um, design spec is also one of the very crucial ones for developers because you definitely need to know how much, how, how much, how many pixels for this card uh, to be aligned from the left of the screen edges. And you know, back then when we dis do design, uh, we do a lot of red lines. And generating this is, you know, it's, 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 it's nice because developers have a very clear idea how these things um, should be implemented. But with, you know, with the app, with all like 10, 20 screens or 30 screens, 40 screens, generating all this manually is a total headache. So a design tool that is available for us is uh, called Zeppelin. I hope that some of you are already using this. Uh, if, if not, definitely explore that with your designer. Uh, Zeppelin is one of the very nice tool that actually coming out a few years back um, that help us a lot. So why is Zeppelin? So Zeppelin is actually a tool that can take in design from different design tools like Sketch, as I mentioned, or Photoshop or Figma. And then when we design that, the, the screens, and then we will export those screens to Zeppelin. And Zeppelin will then generate all these specs for the developers to use. So here's a quick look on how Zeppelins look like. So just a very simple interface. This is one of the screen design of uh, our app. And then you can see that, you know, like from when you do a mouse pointing, you can see the gap between the cards and the label. You can do commenting. You can see what are the specs of the text. For example, if you point at the text, you can know the text size, the text color, um, you know, all, all the information that you need for implementations. So these are things that you should not actually try to figure out from the design file itself. You, you can get all this information from Zeppelin. So it's, very, it's a very nice tool um, that's available for designer and also developers, of course. And uh, definitely, uh, if, if, if your designer is not using that or your organization is not using that, definitely try to you know, uh, look at it and, and see how it can help for developers. So, this is one of the things that you can expect from designer, of course, complete design specs um, with all the values that you can use directly in implementations. And remember why I mentioned that you, the designer should design in 1x uh, base sizes because if you then co uh, export them to Zeppelin, every values in the Zeppelin can be used directly uh, at 1x. So it's, it makes communication so much easier. But if there's any problem, you know, through Zeppelin you can also pinpoint a specific uh, sections on the screens and then you know, tag the designer to say, hey, what are the specs of these or what are the things that should happen in this part of the screens and stuff like that. So that's design spec. Then interaction design. You see, there's so many things that happens. You know, when you talk about design, it's just like, oh, you're just going to do some screen designs. But actually, for designer, there's a lot of things that you should do. So interaction design should be one of them as well. And often you probably will get this. You get a bunch of screens, um, and probably will have a little bit more, a little bit information, but you do not know how each screens are connected. So one of the things that designer should provide you of is, of course, the most basic one, a screen full diagram. This is definitely what they should provide you. Um, you should not figure out as a developers. Um, but of course, screenflow diagram is just, just uh, the beginning of the story. Um, 
when you talk about interaction, it's more about um, what happens when you tap on these buttons, these screens comes in, how is the patterns that coming in and stuff like that. So there are a lot of tools out there for designer already um, for doing simple interactions to complex interaction. Um, but one of the tools that I really want to highlight today is uh, Principle. So I've been using Principle for years. Uh, it's, it's a really nice tool for, it's a very easy to learn uh, tools for designer to actually create a very complex interaction um, mockup. So it's a very nice way to communicate um, how this, how, how, how screen should trans, uh, how screen should be having the transition from one, from A to B, or how these elements should animate and stuff like that. So um, this is the interface of the uh, principle. It's, it, 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 it actually looks uh, very simple, but actually can do very powerful things. Um, it's ac actually a timeline-based um, animation design tool. So um, when, you, when you play around with it, if you download the app, it has a free trial on the Mac. Um, you, you, can you, you can easily understand how it works from screen A to screen B, just move from one screen to another screen, and then things will move. So the concept is very simple, but to master it, of course, you, you need to spend a lot of time on that. But this is one of the two that designers have, actually, to create a very complex interaction so that they are able to create something really great. So how, what, what happens if you use principle? So for designer, of course, the first create the static mockup, and then they can import them into the principle, and then create an interactive and animated mockup. And they can export it in different formats, uh, or different kind of uh, demo, for example. Uh, you can export it in video, or GIF file, or their own PRD file, where you can play it on your phone. So you can actually interact on your phone. That's a very powerful feature, because I've been using this to fool some of my colleagues to, to tell them that, hey, we already have the apps built. But actually, it's just a, a mock-up uh, built by principle. But it's so real that the uh, non-suspecting people will not know. So it's a very nice um, way to actually do user testing, uh, especially if you care about some of the interactions, uh, whether the users understand or not. So this is one of the examples um, how principle can be used to create. So this entire thing is created in principle. So all the interactions, all the animations, all the scrolling, all the animated, um, you know, the arrows, everything is done in principle. And it looks so real that even sometimes I can fool by myself that I, I, I mistaken it as, as a real app. So it's, that power, it's the power of the principle app. But Having this tool, of course, like oh, you can create nice interactive mockups. Um, developers will still need a little bit more things to implement. So, of course, for example, if you see the animated arrows just now, um, for designers, they should provide you the uh, animation specs. And this is how I actually provide the uh, specs for the, the developers, um, giving all the details, um, you know, the changing of opacities, um, you know, the the X, Y, position changing, and uh, delays, and then repeating. And all this narrative way of describing the animation helps. Because um, first, if the, the designer is not able to explain that in text or narrative way, probably that animation is super complex or super, un, uh, super hard to understand. And second is that all this narrative way actually is very understandable uh, by the developers, and actually it can be easily converted in codes, which I will show you example a little bit. So then, of course, um, in the uh, video just now, you saw some of the you know a little bit more complex transitions or animations. So same thing, like uh, for me, I will just provide them all these specs, like for the text. Um, changing of opacities, what are the delays, what are the position changing and stuff. And then I also provide the, uh, a little bit of a simple graph to just tell them what happened at what point. You know, um, you know for the part number two, it should happen after 200 milliseconds. So all these specs helps. 
Uh, it's not easy for designer to generate all this because these are all manual works. Hopefully there are tools uh, in the future that can generate all these things automatically based on what the, uh, what the designer has been designed. But uh, all these things are manual works. But uh, I, I think it's worth spending the time because uh, once I have all these things, the developers doesn't have any question at all. They just implement it as designed, as expected. So everything is great. And as I mentioned, what, what does it mean? Uh, this is, uh, I mean, in Android uh, example, of course. Um, and this is actually something that I communicate with the developers and then they just let me know that actually the narrative way is as easy as just reading it and convert it in code. So you can see that when I say delay for 100 milliseconds uh, in Android code, just say set start delay 100. That's it. It's, it's like a direct translation. And the developers doesn't need to think. They just need to apply the syntax, the, the correct syntax, the correct way to apply that animations. And you will be, the, the, the developer will be able to achieve um, what has been designed. And of course, um, animations, um, not just moving from point A to point B, um, there's also some easing curve that the developers should always use. So, you know, there are some things called linear out, slow in, fast out, linear in, fast out, slow in. This is for Android, of course. Um, but uh, so some of the tips that we've been using, um, this is also uh, covered in the material design guideline. So it's very simple. So because most of the time for animations, it's always about whether the item is or the element is already in the screen or not. If an element is already on the screen and trying to move from point A to point B, we use fast out, slow in. Okay, and if there's something coming from the outside to the screens, we use linear out, slow in, and for objects that exit the screens, uh, we use fast out, linear in. And these these are just uh, 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 the 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 basic uh, rules that we've been using, and it has been working quite fine um, for us. So it's like a cheat sheet for the developers. Like oh, when there's a things moving. From point A to point B, we use this easing curve. So that's for uh, interactions design. Uh, and some uh, alternative, of course, is, is very nice as well. Framer, Kite, Compositors, uh, Envision Studios. Um, but principally, it remains um, the best uh, so far, uh, in my point of view, of course, because the designer doesn't need to learn coding. For example, Framer, you need to learn a little bit of coding. Um, but for principle, you don't need to do coding, but you can still do a very complex interaction. So for developers, what you should expect from the designer, of course, uh, is first the screen flow diagram, the basic one. If they are not providing you a screen flow diagram, definitely get them to provide you when it's necessary. Um, then uh, a high quality interactive mock, um, like the, the one that I uh, show you just now with principle. Um, they should be the one who learn and also build that so that you understand how screen, how, how the element works, how screen transitions works, and also ready to use spec. Definitely very important for them to look into it. Then the last one is about animation design. So interaction design is not enough? Definitely not. If you still remember the, these uh, animations um, that I showed you just now in the uh, principal mockup, um, you probably might be thinking how they are able, I mean, this is actually already in the app, in our app. So how developers actually able to achieve these kind of animations, okay? Um, it's not really complex, of course, but it still requires some uh, effort if you're trying to do it in code. So one of the uh, new design tools that coming out a uh, few years back from Airbnb, uh, it's called Lottie. So it's a very really nice, little animation tool or, or animation li library that helps a lot for designer to actually create very complex animation to be used in app. So Lottie is a mobile library uh, which works in Android, iOS, and also web. Um, the caveat is that the designer have to do it in After Effects, which is another tool that is pretty hard to master. Uh, but for simple animation, it's, uh, it's quite easy. Uh, it's, it's not something tricky. And uh, they can export it as a JSON file where you, where you then can use it on your mobile um, applications uh, once you use the Lottie library. 
So how does it work? So first, of course, you talk about creating illustrations or creating whatever that you want to animate. Then you can go through the AI path, uh, the illustration path, or you can use another plugin uh, for Sketch called Sketch to AE. So you can import them to AE, and then in After Effects, you can animate them. And then once you animate them, you're satisfied with them, you can export it um, to a JSON file and uh, use the Lottie library on your Android or iOS or web, and then you can just have the animation there um, for, your, for your use case. So some of the tips um, probably is more for designer, but some of the things that the developers should also know. Um, so when the designer creates the animations in After Effects, um, the After Effects is using pixel as the base unit. So how do you want to translate that to the DP value in Android or the point value in iOS? Um, it's actually just the same at 1x. So let's just say in your screens, your loading animation should be in a, in a box of 3, 230 DP or point square. So that also means that in After Effects, the designer should design the animation in 230 pixel. So, and there, and why it's important because if you have a larger, uh, larger size in After Effects, the size is larger. So definitely you just want to have the most optimized size that you can use in your applications. And of course, um, they have to be in vectors. They can be in bitmap, of course. Um, Lottie allows the designer to use bitmap uh, in the animations, but it's not very recommended because uh, it actually makes the whole animations a little bit more laggy and also the whole animation file larger and also hard to implement. So for our use case in Lottie, we always try to make sure that everything is vector so it can be, it can be scalable as needed. And it's actually make the file very small. So animation like this is probably just less than 100 kilobytes. So it's really, really small. And of course, um, one of the things that should be aware is that when if your designer is sending you something that doesn't work well on Android or iOS, sometimes it happens. Because some, some, sometimes not all After Effects features are supported. So if something is not working as expected, definitely go back to your designers and get them to check again. Because um, what I found out is that if the animation works in web, uh, web version of the Lottie, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it works on Android and iOS because the implementation way is different. So definitely get the designer to check that it works for all platform before they're sending you the JSON file. Um, so in Android, of course, uh, you can also do icons animation like this. So it's something that's covered in material design where you can do very nice icon animations. And one of the tools out there it's actually written by one of our speakers uh, here, Alex. So uh, it's called Shape Sh Sh Shifter. So Shape Shifter, Shifter is able to allow the designer to create uh, animated icons um, that Android developers will be able to use, um, just like that. But the designer should uh, will have to know. Um, we have to go and learn the tools and then animate the icons. But it's not something that is really tricky to learn. Uh, it's just if you have to look at it, you have to spend some time to create a perfect animation. And then the developer will just use it uh, as an animated vector drawable in Android. So for animation design, um, first, uh, definitely, they should provide you a demo how animation should be used. For example, for our case, the loading animation that you see just now, um, I showed the developers, hey, this is the way that we should use the animations um, in Lottie. And then, of course, they should provide you the JSON file, the Lottie JSON file. Um, and then, of course, the Lottie has, is also pretty at once um, in a way that they can tie to certain things like progress. For example, let's just say you have a loading bar that's load from 0% to 100% and it can fail at some point. So Lottie actually allows you to do something like when 
you know, tied to a certain progress and it fails, it shows another animations. So that's pretty uh, at once, but it's something that the designer should actually let you know um, which, from which frame to which frame is the failure frames and stuff like that. So if, if the designer is wanted to use the animation in such cases, they should let you know as well. You should not be the one who actually figure out. So that's pretty much um, all the things that I want to show, like all the design tools that's available for the designers, um, which you can expect as a developers. Um, but developers, just give me a little bit seconds to talk about what you should, you, what you can also help for designers. You know, because I'm a designer, of course, myself, and I work with a lot of developers over the years, and I found out that sometimes uh, it's a matter of uh, misunderstanding or communications. So just a, just a few things that, as a developers, I think that you can help out for designers. Um, of course, first thing is, you know, don't, don't do everything yourself if it's possible. Um, if it's possible, get a designer to provide you everything. Um, I mean, I know it's, it's pretty tricky some, in some cases because the designers probably is, uh, is hard to com uh, it's hard to communicate or it's hard to contact. But uh, I really suggest you not to, you know, give the designer a, a, a sweet time, you know, definitely give them a hard time. Getting them to provide you with everything because they should be the one who realize that they have the responsibility to provide you everything. Um, of course, Always try to communicate with the designers with the same language. Okay, Develop, uh, Android developers, when you talk about FAB, uh, the floating action button, the designer should actually know that. Um, because they should not speak a different language because it's really hard to communicate if you speak a different language. And especially in different platforms, you have different things referring to different things. So designers should be the one who actually aware of that. So developers, if you're aware that the designer is picking something else, you definitely have to correct them or let them know that, hey, this is not what's happening in iOS, for example, or this is not hap what happened in Android. Uh, you should have a look on the guideline and stuff like that. If you have any questions at all for the design, ask. Don't assume. Um, actually, we, we, I've been experiencing a lot that uh, the developers has been uh, assumed things should behave like this or should be like that, and then end up it's actually in, uh, implemented in a different way. So I really advise that always go back to the designer whenever it's possible, because they should be the one who actually really answer your questions. Uh, you should not be the one who spend your time trying to think or trying to guess how things work. Um, so this is one of the things that uh, I really, uh, really appreciate for the developers is that uh, you, you have to understand that designers, is, a lot of designers is not coder. They do not understand how code works or they do not understand how you know, things work in the coding world. So whenever it's possible, as a develop, from a developer point of view, always provide the input to the designer about what's possible. For example, let's just say today I design a screen with this interaction and this UI element. And when you look at it, you think that, hey, this is really tricky. It's probably going to take two months to do it. Um, I mean, it will be helpful if, let's say, you go back to the designer to tell them, hey, this is going to take, take two months and it's going to be uh, really tricky. Uh, we have an alternative that is much more easier. Uh, what do you think? That will, be hel that will be really helpful because a lot of time, designer doesn't know what is available out there. Um, for me, I mean, I always try to look for developers development libraries that's available out there to see what's possible and what's not. Um, but a lot of time, designer doesn't uh, have that concept. So it, always, it will be always helpful for developers to just give them a little bit hint that this is much more easier and, and it's possible. What do you think? And then probably we can tweak around it to make it um, similar to what you want. So definitely always, always suggest alternative if, if it's possible. Uh, as I say, I understand most of the designer doesn't speak code, uh, doesn't speak logic as well. <laughs> they, they, they are, they, I mean, for developers, you guys are speaking about logic, but for designers, uh, some of them are not logic, it's more, more on the visual kind of things. 
So always help them to understand the constraints. For example, they probably do not know some of the technical limitations or API limitations. Um, definitely help them to understand that. That would be very helpful. Um, try to avoid jargon, of course. Some of the things that uh, when the developer says the whole sentence, <laughs> I have zero idea what they are talking about because they are trying to speak in you know, the terms they use in code. Um, whenever it's possible, of course, I'm not saying that every time, but uh, if the designer doesn't understand at all, trying to use some um, simple words to explain it um, so the designer is able to understand that and provides you with alternative uh, solutions. And this is actually some of the things that uh, I, I find it very uh, important is that uh, I think developers should also understand the business goal uh, or the use case why certain things uh, is designed. Because a lot of times, things are designed this way, but the developers will just do it for it uh, for as requested. But they do not understand or they do not actually realize what, what, why it was designed that way. Because some of the things, some of, sometimes actually I realize that when the developers knows that what's the business goal behind that design decisions, um, they are able to provide a more efficient design um, implementation or, or technical implementation. So I think it's very important. And the last one, of course, uh, even if you are not designing, definitely always, always observe and understand the beauty of design. Um, you know, like one of the things that I realized in my startups, uh, Fabulous, is that when we force the design thinking for all the developers, they, whenever they start implementing something, they also start to think about from a design point of view. And sometimes they even actually come back to me saying, hey, Taylor, I don't think this is a good idea. Maybe we should try something else. And hey, sometimes they are right. So I think, you know, like as the developers, uh, writing codes, writing clean codes and stuff like that is important. But I think observing, understanding, enjoy the beauty of uh, design is also important. So just a recap, um, I've covered uh, what are things that you can expect from designers, a lot of things. Um, visual designs, screen designs in uh, correct sizes, design assets, everything provided for you in proper formats. Interaction design, showing you how the screen design, uh, how, how the screen transition works, how certain elements should be animated, and also animation design. So they provide you all the JSON file, all the animation that you should use. So what's next? So a um, couple of months ago, I saw these tweets. I find it very funny. Um, so you know, like a lot of people, a lot of designer actually says, "Oh, maybe one day, you know, we can publish the production from our design tool." Um, it's not going to happen. I know <laughs> it's not going to happen because there's so many things that you should you should cover. But before that happens, of course, hopefully it can happen. But before that happens, um, developers and designers should always work closely to make sure that you have the best product ever. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Taylor Ling. Uh, you can follow me at Taylor Ling uh, at, in Twitter. Um, my, my startup is fabulous, so you can check it out on iOS and, and Android. Thank you very much. Thank you.